season four, episode 73. <laughs> Hello again, everybody. This is Life's Learning Curve. I'm documentary producer and education tech guy, Paul Hart. What is Life's Learning Curve? Well, we use stories. We do storytelling, life stories, retelling true stories to underscore just how we got to be the current version of us. And we're constantly learning and we're striving to improve. We all can be better, a better us. Today's episode, we're proud to revisit a man, a man who found a balance and true happiness in his life. Not a perfect life by any means, that's just not possible, but one of, well, let's say contentment and satisfaction. Hey, think about this, late at night, while you're driving somewhere by yourself or you're home after work, or maybe it's that moment just before you fall asleep at night. You think a little bit, you dream a little bit, that fantasy about your life, change. You contemplate moving forward and you becoming the best version of you. Well. You're in for a real treat today as we retell a story about my friend and mentor, Clay Greger. Now the things he says and the way he says them, well, they may make you feel a bit uncomfortable. It may make you think (laughs) about your life's direction. But as Clay says, hey, contrary to popular opinion, life is not just a dress rehearsal. (laughs) True, yeah. I'm Paul Hart, tell me a story. Sebastian. Let's go. Life's Learning Curve. I'm Paul Hart. Episode, Trust There's Water in the Pool. Stand by. On today's episode, we revisit some random thoughts, some stories, some philosophy from Key West's own Clay Greger. Here's a Vietnam-era veteran, a father, a husband, a successful businessman, entrepreneur, a few times over, an author, and the focus of a feature documentary about him several years back. Now, well, first of all, I'll tell you this. Based on what I know about Clay, he probably would strongly dislike a list of his accomplishments, and he doesn't look behind himself too often in life. But I'd have to say he's an amazing mentor. He's been an amazing mentor to me. So here's a guy who has steered my ship through life's navigational beacons and helped me find the other side, the open water. On today's episode, I want to share some of Clay Gregor's writing, his content that, well, some of these pieces made a difference not only to me, but I'm sure to many, many other readers. Now, life offers us all kinds of choices and directions. Some of us move forward with confidence, and some of us move forward because we were given a nudge to go one direction or another. With more on this, I want to share one of the introductions to Clay Gregor's first published book. An introduction to the book, Last Flight Out, Key West, A State of Mind by Clay Gregor. Mile markers are used to denote distances along the highways, and in Key West, there's really a sign right on Whitehead Street that reads, Mile Marker Zero, End. I've always wondered why people get such a kick out of that. People are always posing to have their pictures taken there, and right beside that sign, Zero Mile End. Maybe because the end of something means the beginning of something else happening right at that moment. When you stand by that sign, you are in that incredible moment of time. The beginning and the end, all at the same time. Perhaps this is the reason that Key West captivates the souls of so many of its visitors. And it's a place where people find themselves and wondering about their own lives, not just coming and sitting in the sun or going fishing. Key West became my Shangri-La. And it's where I've lived for over 25 years, held captive by its mystical, magical charisma. Now, I own a store in town called Last Flight Out. It's an old town in Key West. And some people just can't figure out what the store's logo means, and they come in to satisfy their curiosity. (laughs) I call those people shoppers of life. Their inquiring minds just need to know. I've seen over a million people stand at the door of my store and in all those years I've come to realize there's only really two kinds of shoppers. Shoppers 
and non-shoppers. <laughs> now, my opinion is not based on their buying anything, but it's about those people who have curiosity to find out more. And they are the shoppers of life. And well, non-shoppers, they peer into my store with this bewildered look on their face, and they usually say to the person they're with, oh, "I don't, I don't know what this is all about. Let's uh, let's go get something to eat." Now the shoppers say, "Let's go in and see what this is all about. We can eat later." Personally, I don't believe that people should ever be satisfied. There's so much more to be had with life, and it has nothing to do with selfishness or nothing to do with greed. It has to do with pursuit of happiness. Very simple. An approach to life. This just happened a month ago. The lady was standing behind the guy, and the guy got started and, and tell me some stuff. And the lady was standing behind him. Oh, this is a big one. Uh, and he's rattling on and on and on and on, and she's giving me a look like. I'm so tired of hearing what he has to say. So she had reached around. I had a different section. She reached around. She grabbed the shirt and she said, "Harold or something. How do you like this?" He said, "No, I don't. Put it back." So she put it back. So she stood there, and I knew she was getting frustrated. And all of a sudden, she said to me, "No, she said, I'm gonna go outside and have a cigarette." And I said, "No, that's okay. I smoke. I'm smoking here." She said, "No, you can't." So she walked outside. Now she was standing by that door, and he was still talking right here. And she's looking this way. And I wrote a story. The title was "Who Dies First?" Because I know what she's thinking. I hope he dies before me, so I can get on with my life. Because this is a terrible way to live. And I know that. I know that. You know, that's not an uncommon thought between couples, especially when you're married for a long time together. You know, I hope this guy would die so I can get on my life. It's my only escape. Now, that may not be a good topic for a seminar, but if they look inside their hearts and souls and their minds, that thought is not uncommon. I spend very little time of my life contemplating how long or how far I've come. Sure, I still set goals and I have dreams, but I think about time in terms of well, mile markers, the road signs you see at the side of the road that have numbers on them to let you know how far you've gotten. I've passed a lot of mile markers by in my life, and I have no way of knowing how many markers are left for me before I have to pay the ultimate toll. <laughs> I try to keep on going and don't spend a lot of time looking at what lies ahead. It's not like I'm living in the moment; rather, it's I'm living to enjoy the moment. What matters is that I'm still traveling on my own highway until that toll booth actually comes into sight. Now this book is for people who, for some reason, once they've acquired all they've wanted or do or fulfilled their dreams in life, they're stymied as what to do next. It's for the shoppers of life, the people still curious, still excited, still full of adventure, and they might need a little nudge to keep them going. The mysteries that lie ahead. It's it's for people who, after they've reached the point in life, they stop to take a brief respite, a rest, and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Then, for some reason, they want to start back on that wonderful highway, but they don't know whether they want to turn right, or turn left, or go straight ahead. So they just sit there, waiting for a crossing guard to come along and point them in the right direction. Now this book cannot do that for you, but what it can do is it can start the thinking process. You're standing at mile marker zero. Which way do you go? But as Clay mentioned, many tourists and customers. Couldn't quite determine what his store was all about. They might peek in and make that snap decision: yay or nay, go in, don't go in. What is this store? And to help those people, he'd always kind of laugh. And then he、uh, thought about it. He created this poster, this flyer, and he—it was a one-page read, and he stuck it for free right on the front door frame. And it was called the story of last flight out. A little bit creative and. Full of truths, with a glimmer in his eye, he'd say to customers, "Take one. They're free. Read it." 
look left, look right, and say, yeah. Might just change your life. But he wasn't kidding. Often in the same day, and I've seen this, I've been there when I've seen this happen, that same customer would often return and say, Hey, I just read the story of Last Flight Out that you gave me at the door. I had to come back and check this out. I read it during lunch. And Clay would say, Well, come on in. And he'd pull out a stool and they'd sit down and talk. Now, with permission from Clay, the author, I want to read to you one more thing. It's the story of Last Flight Out, and to me, it's a one-page masterpiece. During the middle of the late 1970s, there were only two ways to either arrive or depart Key West. Now, hitchhiking didn't count. One was by car, wandering down the black ribbon of road called US-1, A1A, consisting of more than 40 bridges and highlighted by the notorious Seven Mile Bridge. The bridge back then was extremely narrow, with only inches between passing cars. Now the other way was Air Sunshine, the only airline to service Key West back then at that time. Their first flight arrived at 9 a.m. in the morning and it ended with the last flight out at 11 p.m. each night. Now this airline was affectionately called Air Sometimes due to its inability to fly on schedule. During that period, Key West was only visited by a small number of tourists and it was considered to be one of the world's best kept secrets. It literally captured those who visited and the most often heard comment was well, I'm not leaving until the last flight out. It was a Shangri-La filled with like-kind, like-minded people. During those years, the bars would close around 10 p.m. and they would announce, last flight out, instead of last call. For those scheduled to leave on the 11 p.m. flight, they would be in for surprise when arriving at the airport, they'd often find that the plane was not flying or was full. Now, in addition to that, the airport bar was open 24 hours a day, and all the service employees from Old Town would gather there, and the party would just be starting. <laughs> Sometimes the flight crew would be among the revelers, and hence, that was another reason the plane would not be departing that day. However, this was not cause for despair, because what they did was, they just extended their stay one more day in paradise. In fact, there's still some people in Key West from the 1970s waiting for their last flight out. The last flight out story doesn't exclusively apply to Key West though. It doesn't even have to deal with a location because look at we've had all of us a last flight out within us. It's that wistful thinking of who you'd like to be, where you'd like to be, and with whom you'd like to be. It's that ultimate escape in your mind. It's that thought right before you fall asleep. Change careers, change locations, just do something. Capture that feeling when you're alone in your mind. I can do, I can be. If only, don't say I can't. Believe in yourself. Step out on that 10 meter diving board, close your eyes, lean forward and trust that there's water in the pool. Stop going back down the ladder. And believe that just for today, the sun rises only for you. And maybe, just maybe, you'll start dressing up and showing up. Arrivals, departures, that's what it's all about. And as the story for Last Flight Out, it was once called The Legend of Last Flight Out, but as that goes, uh, you could probably teach a full philosophy course around just that one page. There's a lot to unpack. I don't worry about old age. I don't worry about a portfolio. I don't worry about a career. I don't worry about this. I don't worry about that. All I know is I have got to live life as best I possibly can on a daily basis. 
and not have any fear about it all. I said at that time, that looking back, it didn't happen that afternoon. I lost all my fear back though in those days. So I don't have the normal fears that people have, like, should we move? There's not a, I don't understand what it would be like not to move. Should I open this business? I don't understand what it would be like not to open the business. Should I do this? I don't understand. I don't have to be counterintuitive. You know, I am the person who stepped off that 10 meter diving board, closed his eyes and leaned forward, you know. Now some people have told me that I was one of the few people who recognized Clay's wisdom when others weren't even listening. Ah, maybe. I, I don't know. I don't know. All I know is uh, this guy created the shop in Key West based on these concepts and stories and life experiences. And after knowing each other for more than 20 years, Clay still challenges me to be better. Last time I saw him, he said, What are you doing? What are you thinking about these days? Who asked that? Nobody. I think my mom asked me that when I was 14 once. <laughs> what are your dreams? What are your plans? What do you want to do? Where do you want to go? There's people in your life that are you can't forget, and then there are those who are just plain unforgettable, even if you wanted to forget. But I don't, and that's good. So I've been very privileged to have someone like him and meet somebody like him along the way. As Clay would say, regarding what you do and how you do it, if you're going to progress and be happy in life or do something with your life, believe in yourself and step out on that 10 meter diving board, close your eyes, lean forward and trust that there's water in the pool. For Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. Subscribe to Life's Learning Curve at lifeslearningcurve.org and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podchaser. <laughs> Episode 73, Trust There's Water in the Pool, of Life's Learning Curve podcast was assembled by producers Sebastian T. Dog and... Paul Hart. Editor, Paul Richards. Audio and sound, Riley Hart. Hey, find us on Facebook and listen to us just about everywhere podcasts are heard. Thanks to our guest today, Clay Gregor. A new website coming soon for Clay Gregor and last slide out. We will keep you posted in future episodes. In the meantime, Google this guy. Visit our website, lifeslearningcurve.org, and subscribe, read a blog, or shoot us an email. This episode has imaginative voice recreations to protect the privacy of others. Some names have been changed and characters conflated. Episode 73, Trust There's Water in the Pool. <laughs> I'm Paul Hart, and we will be back soon with more from Life's Learning Curve.